I frankly can't imagine having that kind of secret when you're 18 years old, knowing what is at stake. Well, Jean was very quiet. She didn't mention anything like this because you'd vanish if you spoke out. Everybody was so anxious to help the country because the things did not look at all good. My sisters and I, we all went to the same school until the Americans came over and we had to go. They took our school and they lived there. So we evacuated to the boys' school out in the country. We saw different things up Wesley Road, like there was a big tank trap, which was kind of funny because the German tanks could have gone round each end. And there was also an observer corps up there, two guys with a binoculars. If Germans weren't in the vicinity, they heard the siren, they'd have to go up. We lived on the very, very outskirts of Berry St. Edmunds. And I mean, out of the back fence, there was the fields, corn, things like that. So it was like living in the country. They were all over the country, the Americans were, and the, yeah. the girls fell for their uniforms, the way they spoke, and because they had plenty of money and the poor little English boys, the soldiers and that, didn't have very much. So it used to be a problem sometimes in town at the dances. My mom was a volunteer for the Red Cross whatever sort of local canteen that they had in Barry St. Edmunds. And I think that was a, a common thing for people to do. And so she would serve up coffee and donuts for the local military people. In particular, there was an airfield called Ruffham that was right near Barry St. Edmunds. In fact, it was walking distance from the downtown area. John and some friends left the base and they went to this place. And when he saw Jean, he said to the guy, that's the girl I'd like to marry. My dad was born in Selma, Alabama, 1917. Had a large family. As he's growing up, he ends up uh, going to Auburn University, and he was in the ROTC program there. So he graduates, goes into the Army, and starts out his Army career in 1940 in the horse-drawn artillery. So he got to get very involved with horses, and he loved that. The Army uh, knew that uh, horse and artillery was not going to be uh, really important in World War II, and they were starting to fill other communities with uh, people to get ready to fight. In the end, he went into the Army Air Corps for the rest of the war and then transitioned to the Air Force when they established that as a separate Air Force. My father ends up as a bombardier navigator and the aircraft that he was put into is B-17s. So they get to the European theater, and he's there early to where the key thing was is that they're still learning to fight with these bombers, and they didn't have air uh, fighter coverage, which is really important. They, the, the fighters could escort them to protect them for just a little while, but they didn't have the range to go all the way to the targets. And of course, the Germans knew that, and they would attack them when the fighter cover went away. And they just got slaughtered. Even though they were incredibly dangerous, he kept on flying those missions when he didn't have to because he didn't think he could be a good planner, which was his role now, without understanding what's changing. Because the operating environment was changing fast. The theories on, uh, at the beginning of the war that a, 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 the B-17 could go in by itself and protect itself fatally flawed for a lot of people. And so you had to figure out how do you survive this. Jean used to get so scared, she told me, um, when he went on these raids, because she never knew if he'd ever come back again. The airfield where my father worked was going to throw a party. 
This is uh, actually a description from my mom, that whoever my mom was working for at the Red Cross said that the ladies that are volunteering there could go to this party. And my mom was quite excited because they didn't have parties very often. Mummy, who was an awful flirt, she had to chaperone them. And that was just her excuse to go out to dance with the, the older Americans. <laughs> As my mom was coming into wherever the party was being held, my father was just, I believe, waiting for her to show up. And he, and he went right for the door and introduced himself. And my mom was quite taken by, you know, this aggressive yank. And that's how they first met. And we have some pictures that night of them when they first met, um, which I think is kind of unusual for a couple. After my parents met at that party, I'm assuming that somehow they started dating. But she was almost certainly at that time at the Cambridge School of Arts studying art. She wanted to be an artist that was a passion for her, her entire life. She talks about a lot of things about how interesting it was, how difficult it was. But one of the, the things he liked to uh, describe was the very, very first day of school, where whoever the teacher was, the professor was, was they took a piece of paper, crumpled it up into a little ball, put it on the table and said, draw it. And she always thought that was just wonderful because it, it sounds simple, but it's very, very difficult to get the angles, get the shades. It made quite an impression on her because she kept talking about it all of her life. Barry was a garrison town. And so we had the barracks there and we had all these places for the troops where they lived. One day there was quite an experience. I was looking after my horses in the stable and the siren went and we had to run home to go in the cellar. And uh, as I was running down the driveway, Jean, she was cycling past. She didn't see me, and I was running to go up the road. She got halfway up Wesley Road, and this German plane came along, and he was so low flying, really low. She just said that he looked down at her and they eyeballed each other. That was her very words. The women in the house were yelling at her to go indoors, and she wouldn't. I got pressed in the head when he went over, and I just saw the outline of it, and uh, the cross on the side of the plane, it was Adonia, and uh, he went over the barrack square. Thank goodness there was no troops on there. He was looking over the, the area and obviously photographing, because I have a an actual picture that one of the Rotten Tower volunteers gave me, and uh, it said the Luftwaffe, um, 31st of August, 1940. When um, 18 approached, they, the school offered her a deferment and said, you can, you can stay at the school. And my mom flat out turned it down because she wanted to serve her country, which you know, country's facing this awful uh, threat. And even though she loved art, she was gonna go serve her country. So then she goes and signs up, ends up in the Wrens. And how long that process was to where she went through the basics. But then all of a sudden she's getting pulled into a program she doesn't understand she's being pulled into. And uh, she has no idea what's going on until they ask her to sign some scary papers. And then she learns to find out that she is now going into uh, what is called the Ultra Program, and it was about the German Enigma code-breaking business. And that's where she stayed for the rest of the war. One of the things that the British uh, worked very hard to do was to try to break the German code that was very important for communicating for the forces out in the field. There's a lot of uh, trial and error, and a guy named Alan Turing basically figured out how to do that by inventing what many people view as the first real functional computer to be able to automate it because the codes changed so quickly and it was such a puzzle that the only way to do it was with a computer. 
So once they did that, they did most of that work and built the rudimentary computer to break the code was in a place called Bletchley Park. And it was in a place where nobody was really looking for it, but there was intense effort to try to, uh, to make this happen. That's where uh, most of that work went. Once they figured out how to do it, then they spread it to a few other um, sites, and one of them being East Coast, which was focused, my understanding, focused for the Royal Navy code-breaking world, where Bletchley Park was for the Army and their uh, Royal Air Force, I believe. As they grew the program, it, it, tons of uh, information and radio intercepts coming in. They had great manpower demands. And so they started bringing in people to help. And what we would call in the Navy now uh, intelligence clerks. And that's the role that my mom played, which was as an 18-year-old girl, she's given this incredible secret. But she, she is working as an intelligence clerk in East Coast because she was associated with the Royal Navy and taking tapes, I believe, not cards, but tapes and setting the bomb machine, the actual computer code breaking machine, doing the settings and adjusting them since it changed so often. And that's where she did her work. She really came home to visit when she was in the Navy. And um, I think probably a lot of it was that she might slip and say something. And because it was just, they were just, you never, ever mentioned it. When you go into that program, the papers were essentially a warning that you can't divulge anything that you're doing. And they have a official secret sack that made everything classified. And in this case, this program was one of the most secret programs and important programs uh, probably of the 20th century. After the European theater was won, they didn't need the program anymore, the ultra program. So what do we do with all these people with this incredibly sensitive information that we didn't want to be spread around? What do we do with all these people? There's a picture of all these wrens, and they used to, as a cover-up, they used to be taught how to drive those double-decker buses in London, the red big buses. And they were taught to break and skid on oil. Can you imagine? Oh! <laughs> Jean always told us she drove, she was chauffeured generals and people like that. And we thought, wow. And um, I mean, we had absolutely no idea. And that, that was just great of Jean. My father, after the war was over, wanted to marry my mom. And, but she was still in the Wrens and there was a program and a, a system uh, as to how long and when do people get to be demobilized and, and, and revert back to being civilians. My father kept getting these answers and requests that uh, uh, weren't satisfying for him. He wanted to get married now. So he started uh, writing these letters. And one of the letters talks about that my mom was in an unnamed category. And maybe this is a, a complication to her being able to leave the Wrens so they could get married. And to me, I'd never noticed it in those letters, except until recently that, um, of course, she was in an unnamed category. She was in a, a program that no one could talk about and didn't talk about for 30 more years. And, and that was probably one of the complications of uh, my mom getting permission to leave the Wrens and go get married to a Yank. So my father was bound and determined to marry my mom. And he is writing letters, first to Lord Halifax, who was the ambassador to the United States, trying to get permission um, from the English government to allow my mom to demobilize and get married. And he, he got some answers that weren't satisfying, and eventually he got the answer no. So he also wrote a letter to Churchill, who happened to be no longer the prime minister. He was now the leader of the opposition in the conservative party. And he wrote a letter directly to him as well. And I'm not sure if he ever got an official answer. We, we don't have it if he did, but he did get some sort of communication from someone on Churchill's staff 
who told him, hey pal, this is not the way you do it. The way to do it is you need to come back to England, marry Jean Briggs, and then your standing will be much smoother to be able to say, hey, we're married. Can she leave the Wrens and, and come to the United States and join my father? And so that's in the end what the, uh, they did. My father was stationed in Texas, I believe. He flew, which is unusual back then, flew all the way to England, married my mom. Uh, they had their honeymoon and then he flew back. But now he got the check in the box to where they're married and my mom got out of the military sooner than what was originally planned. Bobby and I were so excited. Oh, Jean's getting married to an American. Oh, we were thrilled over the, you know, hills. Men, of course, Bobby and I, we went to the church at Wesley and the vicar wasn't very keen on English girls marrying. He put his voice forward and gave John a book to read. And John said to me one day when we were having breakfast, do you know, Doreen, he said, I read that book from back to front, sideways, you name it, and I did it, so I had everything right. To her, she had to keep it secret for 30 years. That went to the end of the 70s. They're warned and trained not to talk about it, and to her mind, forever. And so she had built this entire new life after she left and got married to my father, and then all of a sudden they declassified the program in the 70s and they were allowed to talk about it, but she was still reluctant to do it because she thought, well, I'm not supposed to talk about it. But eventually more and more came out. Well, my father's reaction was, you know, you gotta be kidding me. You know, we've had all these kids together, six kids together and running around all over the world and you never told me. And you know, my mom's answer was very simple and uh, uh, straightforward is, well, I wasn't allowed to. And that appeals to her, her duty and um, the importance that she placed on it. My mom loved art and was a great artist. Once the hostilities were over, uh, she immediately went back and started studying art again. We have some um, school stuff of painting classes that she started right back up in the fall of 1945 to get back into the artistic world. Mom, of course, was British. Uh, she served in the British military. She left art school. She marries a Yank, and she has six Yank kids. She spends most of her life in America, but she was always British. The thought that she would give up her British citizenship is just, that's just not who she was. She loved her American husband, she loved her American kids, and she loved America. But she was British, and she was not gonna give up that citizenship. And it didn't matter what my dad said. <laughs> they grew old together, they were married for 72 years, so we have a series of pictures of them together. Uh, they loved dogs, golden retrievers was, uh, was the breed they went with. This picture is uh, my parents visiting me here. My mom's sitting in, in the United States. She has no idea what's going on around 2008, 2009. Her really good friend who was in the ultra program with her, June McDonald, connected her and got her into the system. And lo and behold, here comes this uh, thank you certificate from the prime minister, Gordon Brown, for her service. And so she got that as, as uh, finally recognition uh, 50 years later, 60 years later, of her service in World War II. I had no indication whatsoever that uh, that's what she was doing. And my husband assumed that she was just making tea for the blokes. <laughs> it doesn't that sound like a man. <laughs>